pleasure. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I think we'll get this get it rolling because uh, we've got the online starting as well at, at six, so we'll get us started. But welcome to Morley College, everybody, <laughs> and um, and and also to the return of our ACJ lecture series, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say a really big hello and welcome to all of our ACJ friends and especially Melanie Eddy, who is um, hosting our panel event tonight. Um, we also want to welcome back because some very familiar faces, <laughs> Ange Benjamin, Ella Fearinlow and Poppy Norton. And uh, we've been following your careers. And uh, yeah, just to say, we're really looking forward to tonight's lecture to hear all about it. So thank you all for coming. And I'll pass over to Melanie and uh, we'll get on it to start. Another thank you from me, but um, but just want to start out by saying within contemporary jewelry, we have some exciting contributions to the field from individuals who came to jewelry a little later in their professional lives. <laughs> and more and more of us have or will have multiple careers with at least a third of the workforce in the UK in their second careers and many individuals having multiples beyond two. We are very lucky today to have our panel here who will share with us their journeys into a second career in jewelry. And I'd like to thank you, our panel for joining us this evening. And could I please ask you all to briefly introduce yourself and your connections to both Morley and the J, starting over here with Ella. Uh, so Morley College, I retrained in my second career as a jeweller at Morley starting in 2012 uh, and did most of my training over about four years. And ACJ, I joined the year that I graduated from Morley from my second certificate here in 2016. And I've been a member ever since. Yeah. <laughs> I am Ange. I started my um, jewellery journey, not actually at Morley, but my first Morley class was back in 2014. And I was lucky enough to be awarded um, the Morley De Beers Scholarship um, almost a couple of years ago now. So that's helped me sort of push myself slowly out of my day job into um, a jewellery career. Good. So as Helen said, I'm Melanie Eddy, and actually I'm going to get in trouble because I don't remember the exact number of years that I've been involved as a, an ACJ or as an ACJ director, but I do know that it's probably coming up to 18 or 19 years as a member. Um, and I think a decade now, we're close to a decade as a as a director, so very excited to be here today. And I have, and I think Helen will know, Morley holds a special place in my heart because I really believe in further education and opportunities for people to access um, learning in all forms and i'll pass over to poppy next hi i'm poppy norton i make design led statement jewelry but i did a lot of courses here at morley not just jewelry um and morley is the reason really why i'm a jeweler now it was so many amazing courses including the level two certificate which set me on my journey and the acj has been brilliant at supporting me and promoting me throughout as well so thank you thanks poppy so I'm always interested to hear how people came into jewellery. And I like to think that jewellery finds people and not the other way around. And I'm curious to find out more from all of you. So please tell us about your journeys. For example, is there a pivotal moment that led you to embark on this journey with jewellery? Or was the path to jewellery kind of a little bit more gentle and winding a series of experiences or events? Did something particular prompt you to make a change in your career and try something new? Or was it some kind of an interest that was simmering away in the background? So I'm just going to open it up to the panel for them to share uh, their thoughts. Let's go first. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my most kind of formative memory of jewellery and silver in particular, from the age of about five, I was sent to piano lessons, which I was awful at and had to do for many years. But I had a very grand um, elderly Jamaican piano teacher who was just dripping in silver rings and jewellery. And I think I was more fascinated by watching her hands at work than taking on the instruction. <laughs> um, but that whole thing of jewellery as adornment while you work just sort of kicked into my brain, my little childhood brain. And it wasn't until many years after that having had uh, many years as a physiotherapist, that I then decided to pursue um, creative passion. So I've always been making things as a child and always had an interest in three-dimensional structures. 
So I decided to pursue that by going to do a foundation in art and design as a way into 3D making. I uh, think similarly, the passion from childhood for making, uh, I recognise. So I think I was endlessly making things, but for some reason that didn't quite feed through in my first career decision making. Um, I come from a family of artists and I studied art, history, art and film studies at A-level. So you would think that maybe I would have gone to art school, um, but I sort of knew I wasn't a fine artist. And it, my school was very traditional in what was offered, so I didn't do it. So my first career, I landed up in a completely different direction, which was international. And so actually mine is slightly more accidental in that it was really the birth of my second daughter that led to retraining because I just couldn't do the international travel for work anymore. Um, and it was fairly haphazard decision in that I knew it was going to be 3D and I considered sculpture, ceramics and jewellery. And in the end, I decided jewellery was probably the most commercial and definitely the one I could most easily do at home. Um, and that's what led me to find Morley and start my journey. Really interesting. It's, yeah, I had quite a similar thing because I worked, I trained in product design and then I worked as an interior stylist for interiors magazines for 20 years I was styling. And I think I was quite good at it and I really liked it. And then I had kids and life changed um, because of kids, but also medical issues. And also the recession hit in 20, 2009 and the magazine industry just kind of died, um, partly because of the recession that jobs sort of shrunk and partly because social media meant everyone's a stylist and they're a photographer now. And everything's too slow. People don't like magazines as much anymore because they're <laughs> slow to come out. So I had to really work out what I wanted to do because the job that I wanted didn't exist in the same way. So I missed making. And so I kind of was like, OK, I'm going to just try something new. So I came to Morley and I tried actually three different courses and ceramics like you, printmaking and jewellery. And I didn't think I'd like jewellery, but actually I loved <laughs> jewellery. Um, so, yeah, it's partly because jewellery in the workshop, no kids are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too dangerous. So it's something that's very much for you when you do it. And also there are no screens in the workshop. So it's quite, it does definitely take you back to the hands-on experience that I was missing. Yeah. That's really interesting to hear all the different kind of ways that you kind of got led into jewellery. Um, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about how you thought, well, how you found studying further education supported you in, in that journey. So I'm going to start with end. Um, so you were awarded a Morley College to be script scholarship. Could you tell us a bit more about your experience of this award? and how it helped you progress? Um, first of all, I felt immensely privileged to get the award. I know lots of people applied for it. And it was a bit like being a kid in a sweetie shop. You get this pot that you can uh, <laughs> throw at as many courses as possible, not only jewellery, because I'd always had an interest in three-dimensional work generally it was a brilliant opportunity to try things like metal sculpture did a bit of wood sculpture as well something that i'm exploring a little bit more now as well um, but it also gave me the confidence to lean into my own style um, some of the images that you're seeing of my work i would say are sort of archived now they're not what i'm currently producing i still love making them but now i'm tending to make pieces more with lots of angles and pointy bits, which is something that I've always had and have been a bit reticent, a bit lacking in confidence to push out there. So the scholarship really helped to assert that style by making me create collections, for example, something I hadn't really thought of before. That's really interesting. I think as well that, I mean, and I think I'll hear, we'll hear from the two of you in that further education being a space for both exploration, but also like the embedding of like a new skill set to help like support like what you're trying to achieve, whether it's forms or techniques or material exploration. Um, Alec, can you tell us a bit more about your time at Morley and how it's contributed to the development of your work and your career? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, most people know that my work is always in mixed materials. And I think that was probably a passion I came in with anyway, but I think that Morley probably supported me to develop that sort of aspect more fully. Um, it feels like it was a very free space and a very safe space. Uh, and actually I really enjoyed getting project 
boundaries because they give you something to work within but also to push against a bit <laughs> um i have written some notes so that i don't forget to tell you things um yeah i think i had a few projects in particular where i had kind of breakthroughs one was very early on and it was the inspired by brief um which is you have to go to the vna and find an object that you're inspired by and make a piece in response to that and it actually pushed me to do something technically more challenging than I had previously done and also more conceptual um, and then the fashion collaboration so working with the fashion department to do uh, a catwalk piece which actually I was going to wear but then I realized it's clanking mm -hmm. uh, so this piece which I made uh, while I was here walked down the catwalk and it was made in collaboration with one of the fashion students here who'd done a piece inspired by sort of African um, tribal sort of batik pieces uh, and also a fast making project in my final year actually just really pushed me to start thinking a bit more practically about making because we had to make three pieces in six hours and at the time that felt like an impossibility <laughs> and actually that project then became the basis of my first collection. Um, but I would say along the way, I did lots of short courses and it was there really that I explored materiality. So particular big shout out to Donna Brennan, whose course went unfilled twice before it finally got enough of us to do it. Mm -hmm. And those of us that did it, did it twice and absolutely loved it. It was a contemporary jewellery course, very much exploring materials. We did shrinking rubber and balsa wood and melting things and painting things and yeah you know twigs all sorts of wonderful concoctions and um i think that firm friendships were formed on that course so uh yeah thanks to her fantastic that's real, some real insights into you know opportunities and the different areas you got to try out that kind of forged and forged from so poppy you talked a bit about your style we'll come to that a bit later but i want to start uh, initially um, so you initially trained in product design at Sancho St. Martins and then came to further education um, in jewellery design at Morley. And you said you did some couple of other programmes yeah. here. Um, can you expand upon the reasons why it, why you felt um, your time here was a valuable experience for you and a route for you into your new career in jewellery? Well, it was hugely valuable because I was on maternity leave at the time. I had limited space headspace and time without children i had like three hours of nursery a, a week i mean honestly it was like nothing and it's like okay what am i going to do with that time and actually was talking to my aunt who said this is the time to just embrace everything you know you're not working at the moment try different things do things that you always wanted to do so i looked at morley and i looked at the timetable and so i well what's available in the time slot that i have and it turned out to be jewelry and ceramics and printmaking and I've done printmaking courses before and I love them and the one here wasn't quite what I was after and the ceramics was great in theory I enjoy it but it's too ugh, I'm not one of these people that the alchemy of the kiln I don't like it I like to know what I'm getting and then jewelry was just like wow it's it's precise and you can can you know get it exactly how you want it like I said before it's quite meditative when you're in the workshop because you have to be fully present um, and that to me was amazing and doing a course is great because it's an allocated time of the week that you have to put aside you can't be doing something else you have to be here to be doing it and that when you're juggling everything else is really important because it gives you a sense of self that can be missing when you're in the early years of parenting and it also gave me deadlines that I had to work to there's no excuses I have to get the work done because it was a part-time two and a half hour a week course the level two certificate you had to make sure the work was done otherwise you might get the most out of the course I mean you get as much as you out of it as you put into it so I really did make sure that I did the course and like Ella said it pushed me to do things I wouldn't have picked I mean stone setting not my bag at all my worst project ever but it was good because it made me do it and made me go do you know what I'm never going to do that ever again <laughs> so but I don't wear stones either so it kind of fitted but it, it gave us projects like Ella said the fast making project was huge it was the, again the, the thing that kind of almost started my jewellery career was that that idea of 
it's all very nice to spend 20 hours making a piece of jewellery, but the truth is no one can afford to buy something that takes 20 hours to make. So you've got to think about that to be a commercial jeweller. Um, it was great. That's, that's really it. interesting hearing this. Is, I'm learning things. <laughs> um, I think that's really what you said as well. And I think you all of you touched on that, that um, that space when you're making at the bench where like, and especially now we have so many things that pull on our time and notifications and bings and pops and <laughs> calls. And when you're at the bench, it's that time where you're zoned right in and kind of like focusing on what you're doing. Um, so, and as we can see in, in the images I have been going through, um, there's definitely a sculptural kind of style to Ange's work. Um, can you please tell us about the influences that have informed your bold sculptural approach and if there's any exciting experiences that have helped inform, you know, this work or help shape like the image, this kind of the forms and shapes and kind of, I guess, composition. I've always, I mean, as, as far as I can remember, had a, a lifelong love of architecture and not necessarily architecture in its um, sort of true sense of a building. Um, I love the spaces that it creates out on the whole, spaces in between them, slightly obsessed with negative space. My partner has a whole album of photographs of me taking pictures in funny positions, <laughs> <laughs> various negative spaces, but things that look slightly off um, tend to catch my eye. And I think that's Partly because during my day job, I'm working with the human body and people always assume, oh, we're all nice and symmetrical. We're not. So looking at different bodies and how spaces and bits fit on those bodies fascinates me. And for me, it's about creating pieces that don't always fit in conventional ways because we're not all conventional bodies. As to experiences... Um, yes, I've been to different places in the world and seen different things, but often it's just the mundane day to day things that I find will kind of mm -hmm. captivate me. And I'm always taking photos I've always. That's my way of documenting. And um, that's my sketchbook, really. Although in saying that, again, the scholarship was great for pushing me out of my phone and actually into a real life sketchbook, which mm -hmm. was great. Um, coming back to Morley, things that influenced me here, certainly. Um, doing Paul Wells's class. Paul was um, one of the founder tutors for me who kind of got me into making bigger sculptural type jewellery. Um, but I think all of the tutors here have helped me kind of lean into my style. Um, something else I got out of the scholarship, being able to dabble with different tutors and pick their brains for different insights was, you know, invaluable. Yeah. And are we going to see some interesting things coming out of this new methodology of sketchbook work? And uh, Yes, definitely. I'm currently playing around with sort of um, mixed media, which is kind of a big leap for me. I've always been very metal based, but I have had this hanker hankering to play with wood and timber yes, for ages. You didn't it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, watch the space. That's what I'm saying. Very exciting. Um, so we, you talked a little bit about uh, earlier about your um, kind of work in trend reporting, styling, art directing, and obviously your agility in terms of navigating the, that changing space. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that work and your work also in interiors in that in that, that space feeds into your current jewelry practice? There's a couple of the, oh, perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> images there that re reference that earlier yeah. um, work. Um, well, I think it all started with my product design training, really. Like, I learned to appreciate how products were des designed. And so when it came to my styling, it was all very much, I wasn't a stylist that put lots of twiggly bits or tweaks and flowers up. That was not me. It was all very stylized, very graphic, because I felt like actually if a piece is well designed, it should sit in a space and look beautiful on it in its own right. And it's almost like the hero of the thing. And also... So my jewellery, again, a bit like that, I want it to stand up on its own and just, you know, be a statement. Um, but in the same way, when you create an image as a stylist, you want to give it a flow and a direction. And jewellery is a bit like that, too. I designed my jewellery to make people's eyes travel across your body in a particular way. And it's used to frame different body parts to flatter it in different ways. So I think, again, that's quite similar. You, you literally prompted what I was going to ask you. I was, I was literally going to say, like, how is the transition from moving from, you know, an environment which you can control in terms of the image 
to like taking that taking that almost like curation of the body as it were um, you well, kind of I design when I kind of design in a mirror almost I literally I'm not I've never been a drawer I did art a level I made sculptures and took photos of them I was, I've never been someone that's really brilliant at drawing and I don't like designing in a sketchbook it just doesn't excite me I have you'll see there's a portrait of me going around playing with shapes I literally have a box of shapes that I play with I get out and I play and I've been known to put double-sided tape on me and stick them to me to get the proportions and the, the, the placement um, correct and then but by doing that as well it means that I'm playing with a palette that's quite limited so it means everything I design works together whether you choose to wear it all together or not it's up to you um, please do um, <laughs> but you don't you know the idea is it has an identity and that comes from how I design okay. so it's really interesting to see that like shift you know into that different space so and I'm going to ask you a question, but before I come to that question, actually, because I'm very recently um, and actually got to see some of your work I collect as well, um, very recently was talking to Ella about the shift kind of in, in, in her work. And that just the most recent one just came up as well. Um, so I can actually like you just touch a little bit on how you moved into like almost creating like sculpture. Yeah, yeah. like the so objects that in that like that. Um, in. have the component of the jewelry as part of it so we're just before we get into the other one just because it, it's in my mind because I saw that recently yeah yeah I mean I think it's it feels like a sort of reasonably natural progression somehow yeah. I think I was working very flat and graphic when I first started then I started carving my materials and making them a bit deeper and they had a bit more sort of you know sculptural energy I guess I've always been obsessed by brooches and part of that reason is that they are like miniature sculptures so they just stand alone on their own sort of terms um, and I think then I began being really interested I kept meeting people and they take things away in boxes and they say I've got this drawer at home and it's full of boxes and sometimes I don't know what's in all the boxes god that's really sad I love this idea you know, if you buy a beautiful ceramic or a beautiful piece of silversmithing, you take it home and you make space on your bookshelf or your mantelpiece or your coffee table or wherever. And I liked the idea that people would live with their objects mm -hmm. and that they could literally become artworks. Um, so now when I sort of make these pieces that have little stands, and sometimes people don't realise that they are stands. I had one person say, oh, I really love your new pieces that you made for Collect. I think they're too big for me <laughs> and so oh, the actual brooch is quite small <laughs> um, the bit underneath is just a stand for it but I now sell them with a very basic little sort of glass dome but just you know that's a sort of starter thing people might then want to go on and put it under something else um, but I like the idea that they might go home and be part of people's lives on a sort of more day-to-day -day basis and not just not just for wearing. <laughs> so just to continue with the question I was going to ask was can you tell us a little bit about how networks and memberships, being as we are part of a membership organization <laughs> here at ACJ, um, how they've been a key for you to, um, to you know, your second career kind of progression and success and um, both kind of personal connections, but also like associations and, and like wider networks? I mean, I think, yeah, both the sort of formal and informal networks have been hugely important um, in sort of spurring me on, giving me opportunities, um, and particularly those kind of peer relationships. So since leaving Morley in 2016, <clears throat> I have been a member of ACJ, uh, Goldsmith Centre Creative Links, uh, AN, which I think is the artist newsletter, Design Nation. I was a supporter of contemporary British silversmiths for a couple of years, um, and I was part of London Creative Network at Cockpit Arts, which unfortunately no longer exists because it was amazing. Um, that was European Union funded. <laughs> <laughs> so sadly has gone by the wayside um, but I think also there are a lot of personal networks that have been very important not least of all the group that I sort of graduated with from Morley and the different groups of peers that I've met along the way through different opportunities so I did getting started at Goldsmith Centre and actually it was still in person at that time so we were 25 people basically locked in a room for a week uh, you get to know those people very well and you stay in touch. So actually, I've done things with lots of those people since then, um, and even just staying in touch and supporting each other on a personal level, which is amazing. Um, I would say the kind of peer network and collaboration potential has been really important, but actually also there's been quite a lot of technical learning through those 
groups. Um, so contemporary British silversmiths in the lockdowns ran the most extraordinary technical Zooms where their members shared incredibly openly their technical knowledge with the other members. So just fascinating as a jeweller to be able to just tune into those and learn so much. And suddenly all sorts of terminology fell into place for me. And I really began to understand that side of our sector so much better. Um, and also just made a whole new group of, you know, potential friends, <laughs> which is really nice. Um, similarly, with the cockpit arts and design nation offering support just on things like business, so not just the sort of jewellery side of things, but actually how to develop your, you know, what you're doing. Um, and I've also had funding. So ACJ supported me to work with Zoe Arnold. Um, I've had uh, funding from AN to do a bursary in silversmithing at uh, West Dean. So, yeah, I think it's just so many levels on which those things work. Um, but actually, the one that would surprise me the most looking back now is that Cockpit Arts and Design Nation are both communities of makers across a whole range of disciplines. And actually, as a jeweller, it's been really interesting and exciting and important for me to develop those relationships. And what I found is that I'm incredibly drawn to textile makers and have done some talks and considered collaborations with people working in textiles um, and also talking to people making things in a more sculptural way. So most recently, um, I've been exploring the possibility of a collaboration with Ash and Plum. Uh, who were wood turners, and that relationship came about through yeah. Design Nation. Oh, some of the bits are, well, I was going to say some yeah. of the bits are wood, aren't they? And then, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we actually applied last year to do something together. Unfortunately, that didn't come off, but I know that there will come a natural moment where we will get to do that. So, but yeah, I, you know, and at the more sort of frivolous end, I'm part of something called the Jewelry Ladies. We don't have a formal name, but it's basically me That's and great. me and I'm, lots I'm of people that. from uh, Morley. So it's actually people who know the Morley crowd. It's myself, Helen, Zoe, Annette, Donna Brennan, and uh, an artist called Sally who used to study with some of us. And we just go out and do fun things together. Sometimes we make things. Sometimes we go places. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think those networks have been so important, both. Both when you're sat sort of doing your own thing or something's gone wrong or you don't know how to achieve something and you can reach out. Yeah. But I think also in kind of buoying those sort of creative energies and making you feel supported as you move forward. Definitely. I think, well, depending on how you're working, whether you're working at home or in a shared workshop space, like it can be quite isolating. So having those opportunities to connect one on one, whether it's just with like people that you know that are creative or in jewellery, or it's more through more formal structures like the ACJ. I mean, I know for me, when I first came to the UK, like I, I actually have to say most of the connections and most of the network that has grown from that time came through being invited to a meet an ACJ at the time it was an ACJ London meeting by somebody. And then kind of going from there, meeting other people and, you know, that kind of grew from there. And later on, it grew into opportunities to get involved in education because it's like, you know, one little step and one little branch opens up to like another branch. But actually, you've both, I think, a couple of things that have been said have prompted me actually to ask you guys about in terms of networks and connections. And you mentioned about the change to your work due to like social media and the shift. But actually, all of you do engage on, you know, you engage on social media, your images are up there and you've done some work in television as well. So um, I actually would like to hear a little bit about what you think about. I mean, for me, I feel like that space, although it has its challenges and we all know there's there's pros and cons to that to that space and interacting with it. But for me, it's allowed me to open up, for example, clients abroad, you know, who've connected with me. Do you feel that um, in a way there's a bit of a democratization of the space that's been created by some of these kind of groups and social media kind of connections? And I just like maybe if and if you want to talk about your experiences with that as you kind of entering a new space with a new career in that kind of area. Well, I think it's a balance. I think, you know, people train and work really hard and have earned their place there. And this sounds really snobby, but, you know, 
we do live in a democracy, but there is something to be said for people that have trained us something. Because when you pay me for my work, you're not just paying me for the, you know, four hours it took me to make it. You're paying me for my years of training that led me to this place. You know, I'm not just a jewelry designer. I'm a product designer and a stylist as well. And all that's fed into it. Um, so I don't know. I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram. It's really hard because every everyone's a stylist and great. Everyone's a stylist. Good for you. <laughs> but I worked really hard, 20 years, I worked, <laughs> to make photos that really, you know, that they were powerful images. And, you know, it has... I have to say, I'm really proud of the work that I've done. And, you know, because of that, it led me to have, you know, images of my work on the sides of buildings. But it's and that's been brilliant. But democracy is great. But I think we shouldn't forget that training and craftsmanship um, has a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, I think value. Yeah, definitely. Any, any other thoughts on your experiences in terms of the, the space? In terms of social media? Well, in terms of like, could we could just to follow up on the idea of connections and then just because it came up a little bit earlier and some other things people had said so i mean i think well social media so i totally can see where poppy's coming from and a second career is we're all sitting on the shoulders of something else yeah. in terms of life experience and knowledge and yeah. um you know and that sort of feeds into how we approach the world i think uh i think for me when i first started out it was incredibly helpful because as you just said, you said that democratisation sort of word. I would get direct messages from very surprising people that I would never have imagined might be messaging me. <laughs> um, some of whom I thought were false. I was like, this is a wind up. <laughs> Who's set up a false account? Um, so, yeah, I mean, from that point of view, I think it enables everybody to contact everybody. And likewise, for us to be in touch with people that we admire and like and comment on their work and send them messages. So I think it's a it's a sort of two way street in that sense. Uh, it's also quite challenging because you're making your work and this is a whole other strand of energy Time, that yes. has to happen. Yeah. yeah. And as a result, anyone who follows me will know that I tend to be very busy around events and quite quiet in between. <laughs> People have made the same, <laughs> the same <laughs> deduction from me as well in terms of my output. <laughs> yeah, and I, t I totally agree. I think it, it certainly has its place. Um, for me, I've had, I would say, only positive, um, positive experiences with it. It's enabled me as someone who wasn't always in a space of learning to reach out to other jewellers who I felt I had a good relationship with and ask questions. Um, for example, when I started venturing into working with gold, there's a lovely jeweller in Germany I followed for ages. And I just felt I could contact her. And we had a lovely Zoom, Zoom chat and she, you know, she gave me the pros and cons, where to start. And it was, you know, brilliant. And that was at a time where it was during lockdown. So I couldn't actually ask anyone yeah, or else go in a, to, in a, go to yeah. a class. Yeah. Um, so for things like that, and again, I think you mentioned interaction with clients, people messaging you and seeing your work and commissioning things. It's been great. But yeah, it's like a full time job. And I certainly go through lulls and fall out of love with it. And yeah, I think that's kind of where I am at the moment. <laughs> so as you can see from the images here that, you know, all three of the individuals here have a unique voice in terms of their their work. Um, but. I'm interested to understand that, you know, being, and you mentioned earlier about having the filter and you mentioned about the experience coming from somewhere else than filtering into what you're doing now. Um, do you do you think that you see your practice through the lens of your first career experience and bring insights from that into your work approach? Like, is it something that you're aware of or uh, like, is it something you're actively doing in terms of your perspective or are you kind of like compartmentalizing like, elements that come from different parts of your life experience that have led you to this space. Just interested to know how it is for you. I think a bit of both. Um, I, yeah, I found this question quite interesting because my two careers are so radically different. So my first career, which I didn't say earlier, is, is in uh, international development. Um, so I'm trained as a South Asianist academically and I spent a lot of time working in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, on big sort of social development projects and with partner organisations um, and NGOs and so on. So directly, no. 
<laughs> um, however, I have realised that having travelled a lot has probably filtered into my design process. Mm -hmm. There's definitely quite a lot of South Asian references in my work um, and also other sort of global references. Uh, and I think in terms of how I approach being in the sector as a whole, yes, it has, because I think all of my previous jobs relied on my ability to build relationships and um, collaborate and network and share with people. And I think that that's very true to how I am in this sector as well. And that's really benefited me. So like really in the sense that, that the supporting kind of soft yeah. skills that surround the actual design and making aspect of it. That's really interesting. Thank you. Any, um, I think I came, but it would have been a more natural progression if I had gone, do you know what I want to design and make? I'm going to do homeware products or furniture because that was that yeah. was my world. My yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. But because I had been so immersed in it, I think I was kind of overwhelmed with knowledge and the, the feeling that, well, anything I do has actually been done before. So jewellery was great for me because I had no knowledge and I still have really limited knowledge. I have people coming up going, oh, have you seen so-and-so's work? Or it's a bit like so-and-so's work. And I sound so stupid to everybody because yeah. I say, no. Because the truth is, on purpose, I've gone, I want to get inspiration from everywhere. Textiles, ceramics, furniture, scaffolding, roofing tiles, brickwork, whatever. I don't really want to get my inspiration from jewellery. I think that's so, a good practice. Yeah, because yeah. um, it starts to hinder your creativity because you go, you start to design it and they go, oh, it looks a bit like so-and-so's work. And it's like, well, I have no, if any of my work looks like anyone else's work out there, I have no idea. <laughs> it's not on purpose. So, and it's come through a place of play and exploration. Um, so in some ways, uh, my experience of my previous career sort of fed into Do it. you think that because like you said it was such a shift mm. that it was like in a sense like you mentioned playfulness there was that excitement and enthusiasm because it was like a new a new, yeah, a new absolutely space. and so I think to anyone designing anything everything's been done before we live in a, a you know yeah a cyclical fa fashion you know my kids are wearing what I wore as a teenager it's just how it is everything you know everything based on something historical and then given a tweak and it's the same yeah. so I think you just have to kind of be free and not get too caught up in other people's work and you mentioned earlier Ange about being you know with your work being so involved in understanding about diamond dynamics of how the body works and all that kind of and then that feeding in to some extent not just to your work but in terms of where you saw inspiration in terms of like the architecture is there anything else that you'd like to let us know about in terms of like that approach in terms of like do you kind of keep it separate or is it more like it informs it in a, in a holistic way like yeah i think it's certainly for me i'd say it's subliminal and holistic I'm, I'm a, a sports physiotherapist is my sort of genre of physio so it's very physical very hands-on um, so the type of jewelry that I enjoy making is very physical it's mm -hmm. very I, I love the process of making and often the outcome isn't necessarily <laughs> planned it's oh, all through you know exploration and yeah. play with my hands and I quite like the tussle of it all. So from that point of view, I think it does influence. And also, as I mentioned earlier, having pieces that don't necessarily sit on the body in a conventional way. I, I really love playing with that because it's a bit jarring. Um, and yeah. yeah, I like things that sort of make people go, oh, OK, I'm not sure if I like that. But yeah. That's really interesting to see all those different like elements kind of coming in. So I have another question for you guys. Um, what advice, if any, do you have for people? And this is just open, so any of you can respond how you want to. What advice, if any, do you have for people who are considering a change in career? Preferably to come into jewellery, of course. Not that we're... <laughs> um, is there anything you would like to share that you would have liked to have known before you set off on this path? Oh. <laughs> I think for the change in career, I don't know. I mean, I think be brave and just do it because actually whether you land up doing that thing or not, you're going to learn something probably about yourself and maybe about the rest of the world in the process <laughs> that will help you, whether it helps tell you that that is or isn't yeah. the right thing and whether it lands up being something that you develop. 
I think, yeah, be brave. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Try things. You don't you don't know what you're going to like. And the only way you're going to know is by trying it. But also don't think that if you say, I'm going to become a jeweler, that you have to say goodbye to everything else you've done before. I think we live in an age of portfolio careers. And financially, no one's ever going to make a great living through being a jeweler unless they're like, I don't know. I don't know because I don't know any jewelers. <laughs> but it's 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 really difficult. It's really difficult. And I think there's that feeling as well that, oh, I've set up my website. I've built my website. People will come to it. Uh, I built my website, poppynorton.com, for all of you that want to visit it. But it's no, it, it's not a case. It's not a magic thing that happens overnight. It's that thing of. God, you have to become everything as a small business owner. You're the designer, you're the maker, you're the tea maker, you're the accountant, the photographer, the stylist, the person that lugs everything to shows, the set builder, you're <laughs> the social media manager, you're literally everything, the model as well sometimes. <laughs> you're, you're everything. And so I think, yeah, training to be a thing doesn't really exist, especially if you're a small business owner, you're everything. Definitely. Anything wrong? Yeah, no, I sort of totally agree with Anna and Poppy. And, you know, don't be afraid. I always tell myself, what's the worst that can happen? So everything I've pushed myself to do, whether it's the scholarship or being on TV, it's like, what's the worst that can happen? Someone doesn't watch, someone doesn't like it. You're not going to die at the end of the day. Um, and just enjoy playing and trying different things. I wish I had tried more different courses in, as an adjunct to jewellery. Okay. I did when I did my foundation and I really enjoyed that and that gave me the feel for 3D making. Um, but I wish I'd been braver then and tried larger scale 3D making. Um, but yeah, there's nothing to stop me doing that now. So it's all about just trying new things, give yourself the opportunity, um, particularly in places like Morley. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I think, for one of the things I think for me that I found is that, and I, I have the opposite problem now, and that I made sure I said yes to lots of things. And I went to lots of places that I, you know, by myself where I was very like, <laughs> but that kind of got me out there and got me talking to people and got me doing things that I wasn't necessarily sure I'd be interested in, but then it led to other things. Now it's that I'm kind of got going back where I'm learning to say no <laughs> as opposed to saying, Yes, but I think all of you touched on what was really interesting as well. And I think something we don't often think about is transferable skills. So skills that we have honed, you know, in, in various aspects of our journeys and our professional practices and our lives that then come into jewelry, maybe not in the ways we expect, but, you know, that that kind of support us in terms of whether it's all the things we need around us as, as entrepreneurs and, and, and small business owners, or whether it's how we filter information or whether it's how we communicate with individuals. And I think all of us, all of you have kind of shown that today in terms of what you've um, said. So thank you very much. I think, sorry, yeah, no, to cut them back in. I think if you're thinking about changing career, the thing that's really important is to decide why you want to change career. What are the aspects of things that you enjoy and to kind of keep revisiting. And if it's not making you happy, stop and pivot again because we're in an era where you can keep doing that I guess and don't be scared of things but yeah really come back to what makes you happy if it's the making and and you're not making then get back into making so I just want to give an opportunity to the panel if there's anything that they want to touch on or highlight that we haven't co covered before we go over to the audience first for some questions and then we'll reach out to the online um kind of participants so just wanted to open the field up in case there's something that you been thinking oh i didn't say this and yeah <laughs> i mean i'm just gonna big up morley college <laughs> yeah um, i definitely wouldn't be here without morley i think all the tutors i had were exceptional and they all pushed me poked me you know talking about sketchbooks earlier but anastasia in my first year here she knew i could draw she knew i'd done art a level but i refused to do it and she kept saying, looking forward to seeing that sketchbook, Kelly. Where's that sketch? Where's the sketches? I haven't seen your sketches yet. She just kept on at me until eventually my sketchbook developed. And now I do. That is how I design. I do design. Actually, that's a really interesting point. So once you're out of once you're out of, um, I guess, the structure of a course or education in terms of like pushing you, you talked about projects that pushed you yeah. to do things like in terms of your own self-motivation, what what 
kind of prompts do you guys use for yourselves to keep your practice moving forward? I mean, you mentioned you, you're, you know, and you mentioned about a new way of working in terms of like methodology, in terms of design. But just a thought, like, is there something that you use to prompt you in terms of moving forward? I know, you, like, in terms of like areas you want to progress your work into or explorations to keep it kind of the momentum up. Is there anything that you do? I mean, I set myself visits? projects. Oh, you do. I do do gallery visits, and I often find that a deadline works genius so if I apply for something <laughs> that would be the best way so whether it's a competition or a show or an opportunity or if it's funding but it's it always pushes you to step up you know I don't ever want to stand still I, I never wanted to be a jeweler who just made a thing and then kept making the thing I want yeah. to I'm, I'm on a journey so cook myself yeah I'm like Ella I work to a deadline that's you so got, you've created you've got to get the fear. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, late nights. Um, a deadline. I do numerous shows throughout the year. I've got one coming on Sunday. If anyone wants to come to Mid Century Modern, I'll be there and see all my work. Um, but yeah, every time I do a show, I try and make something new to shout about because otherwise. So that the push for you. Yeah, that's you the push for me. A deadline. You can use that as a way to create the new work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's sort of exploring externally. So I, I'm sort of a bit deadline driven, but I'd like to give myself regular gallery visits um, or exhibitions that I have to go and see and try and get something out of it. And then I'm trying to get into the habit of also doing sketchbook work off the back of those gallery visits, because again, the sketchbook thing was a revelation to me. <laughs> so it's like doing homework, yeah. Great. So one of the things, obviously, you all mentioned about some of the the other things that come into um, running a business, all the other things to support it. And you've all kind of touched on this is something obviously that happens when you're in further education. You have in a way you have license to explore and to play because like that's part of the process. Like, how do you safeguard that when you have uh, shows to prepare for or custom orders or like you know stock that you're creating like do you guys create like a space for yourself to just play at all in terms of your practice I know I'm really bad at doing that I'm trying to like, to do that more often so that's why I'm asking you that I mean I think space has been carved out for me twice in the last few years not because I made it uh but because it just came and it sort of came at the right times um, and once was due to a sort of set of personal circumstances that just put my work on hold. Um, and once was COVID. Mm -hmm. So I think COVID came, I'd been in business maybe for three, three and a half years or something, four years. And it was really beginning to feel like it was snowballing and getting really exciting. And I was really busy and loads of plans. And then suddenly COVID came and just stopped us all dead. But actually, it was a good moment for me to stop dead. Mm -hmm because it made me do exactly what it's just sort of step back a little bit and assess the situation and say well what's working for me and what's not working and and maybe push myself forward a bit more to do slightly more exciting work so that's good to go. Uh, I try and learn something new so something that's you haven't done tweaking before, yeah. tweaking different bits of my brain um I just feel like I need a reboot so whether it's you know a language or usually it would be something creative something using my hands um, but I find that's a good way of just jump starting me okay. feel <laughs> less exciting than you guys know I don't feel I do very much I think in no, my it's head hard to do that yeah yeah. I'm asking. yeah and I've got two young kids as well so it's yeah. you know there's a lot of juggling going yeah. on but there's an element that I think in my head, it's like, oh, do you know what? I'm going to make one day of the week a design week, one day of the week an admin week, and the rest of the week make it. It doesn't work like that at all. It goes from like 100 miles an hour working all night, every night, to being much more relaxed about things. Um, I do try and make sure that I go to galleries. I do sort of fill up my creative cup, as it were. You feel, yes, exactly. Yeah, um, getting inspiration from artwork. Um, but no, I'm not very good at it. No, I'm not either. In fact, I got told I got told off by another maker who I respect very well because when she realized I wasn't doing that. So that's why I'm asking you guys to make to see if you have any secret tips for me going forward. So um thank you very much for your uh insights and for your time. And I'd like to open up to the audience. 
there's any questions, Catherine's. Any of you have ever missed their old career job or in teamwork, the camera Yes. Thank you. Everybody, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I hugely miss being a stylist and working in serious magazines. Unfortunately, the way it was isn't the way it is now. So you're missing like a previous. Concept. Yeah, it doesn't exist in the same way it did. I was in control of, you know, my whole section of a magazine was mine to do whatever I wanted with. It was amazing. Um, I loved that creative freedom. I loved working with the team. I loved working with the photographer. Um, now I'm, you know, in a shed in my garden working on my own and it's not the same and I do miss it. And I think it's also hard because when I was working in magazines, I almost felt like it validated what I was doing. And, you know, look, you I'm, had a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. successful. I'm in a magazine, you know, brilliant. And now it's like I'm in my garden in the Well, I do think workshop. you do have some things to celebrate. Though. No, absolutely. And I'm really proud. <laughs> I've had a really good year. It's been amazing. But. It is hard. It's really hard. Um, I have total imposter syndrome. Huge. Don't. Yeah. Well, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Lynn. If you could take a piece of jewellery from the B&A Jewellery Gallery, what would it be? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I think it would probably be that Calder necklace because I've tried to draw it 350,000 times and I can never quite, it's so simple and yet not. So I think I would have to get that on the table. I've got so many pictures on my phone of different <laughs> bits that I yeah. probably would take, um, but they tend to be the big ornate neck pieces those bits that totally oh, fascinate me no not so much gemstones it's more again it's all about the structure of me the things that you know encompass the body in some way or frame the body in quite a bold way um and i'd much rather go to the furniture gallery <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a particular piece from a particular designer that you're like, well, I'll have all of it. It's in the VNL, I'll have all of it. It all has merit. It's like, all great. And there's nothing, there's many pieces of jewelry that are beautiful, but on purpose, I don't immerse myself in the jewelry gallery. I'm going to add also, add my uh, one in there, even though there's, I mean, I couldn't really decide in terms of the contemporary jewelry section. That would be too difficult. But um, there is, because I was very lucky back in 2008 to spend some time when the new gallery, just before it opened, installing pieces. It, sitting there I was pinning you know pinning and sewing some of the pieces in there and there is a medieval belt buckle that I am obsessed with that is like amazing and so even though it's not a typical jewelry piece that's the piece that I, that I come back to in my head just because of the way it's constructed and it's like all these little stories like a, it's like a little village of I don't know how to describe it but it's very unusual but it's just something that's such, so different and interesting that I kind of find it really interesting so Smiling. Any? Oh, Terry has a question. Yeah. Um, at the moment in your careers, your early careers, um, do you have a balance between um, exhibition shows and retail? And has that changed over a few years? And can you see it developing in a, the same way or another way? as a different balance or exclusively rather than the other. For instance, how does that work for you? I think things are changing so quickly as well, though, that I think you can't say this is how I work because, you know, last year was brilliant. This year has been really difficult for me personally. It's just, I don't know if you guys have yeah, this. So I think a lot of people life's just gone really difficult. So you have to keep pivoting. And I don't personally feel that I found a great balance yeah I know that I like doing my own shows because I think the best person to sell my work is me um because I can talk about it because I wear it because a lot of my pieces aren't just sort of to be worn in one way they you know really turn them around play with it that's the idea of it some of this necklace here moves I mean everything changes so I think 
remembering that you're your best person to sell your work is quite an important thing. Yeah, and I'm like so. you too in the sense that when when things are sold and I'm not there, I miss that interaction. Like I miss that interaction of the the person who's bought it and understanding why they've chosen it, or if they're gifting it to somebody. You know, that is definitely an an important kind of special connection I find. Yeah, for me, mainly online is um, my biggest outlet, but that comes with its challenges because, as Poppy said, you're, you know, the jack of all trades. So that means time spent not only working on the website, but making sure the website's seen. So doing all of your SEO, optimizing things with Google, all of that stuff, which is a whole other skill set. Um, but if you put in the time, I find it does pay off. I'm not at the stage yet, but I have done sort of exhibitions or shows like these ladies. But, you know, I think times are changing from the point of view of stockers as well, mm-hmm. with rentals going up. I think they're struggling, which I think has a knock on effect um, to us as um, potential stockers with them. Okay, thank you. Actually, a couple of hands. <laughs> oh, secondary. Okay. I just wanted to the balance then between uh, the home market and overseas. We don't mention Brexit at all. How did you not mention Brexit? It's been before. How's that working for your online sales? Um, um, me personally, again, it's it, a lot of it is working on you know the back end of yeah. your website, so to speak. So familiarising yourself with how to you know make sure your images are optimized so someone searches for a square ring your ring will come up and not just image 235 so learning all these little tricks behind seo Um, and i have found that that's helped me you know get sales as far away as australia and you know europe Um, but then comes with that the taxes involved in marketing that so is it worth your while so it's it's lots of challenges associated with overseas sales yeah, filling out the customs form for the post office is like a yeah. half a day project. It really is. It's, I mean, honestly, Brexit, Let stuff alone. going to Europe is horrendous to the point where it's lovely having the orders and thank you to everyone that orders from me. Every order is appreciated. But it's, you know, you just go, God, I don't, you know, the paperwork, honestly, I'm not. <laughs> it's overwhelming sometimes that you're not sure it's worth it. Yeah. I'm going to say the same as Poppy. I have to say it slightly put me off seeking an international marketplace. Um, and I was lucky to be taken on last year by House of Mars Gallery, uh, House of Mars, and they are Europe based. So actually what they've done is they kind physically of taken the assignment of my work to Europe. And now I feel like that will be a great way to maybe be represented in that yeah. environment. And they had, um, in a sense, in theory, going for it, they could handle exactly European sales for you. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think having something like that is great, but on sort of individual sales level, as Poppy says, dealing with all those kind of customs and, you know, the codings for what object yeah. comes and from what complicated rapid, sometimes every now, country's different and, yeah. oh, God. Okay, let's not bring it down too much. <laughs> not one size fits all so if people are in the audience and they're like shall I take the tentative step here maybe you've inspired them to do that um, and I think that one size you know doesn't fit all is really the thing that maybe has come across because it is your second career um, if I ask each of you how many hours you put to this a week you could probably tell me that it was never as much as in your first career or maybe parallel. I don't know. Because obviously within our lives, all our other facets, so it's like Feng Shui, it's only a third. We, we can only apply the third of ourselves to it. But my God, that third is huge. <laughs> Um, so with children and like your honesty about what you have to work around is really yeah um, refreshing. Yeah, you know, I think we all hear these stories and we're fed these images of people 
I'm Papa. It will stand what I mean, my friend. <laughs> um, but, you know, refreshing to sort of like the question of, well, if this doesn't work, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And the question is, if this doesn't work, at some level it will work because it gives you the way through to the next stage, mm -hmm. I suppose. And I suppose that's that's all I want to sort of say is, and also I do want to ask you to give us an average of how many hours a week you work on. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, genuinely no idea. Uh, no, I'm terrible. I've got all these apps that are meant to time how long I take doing yeah, things. I, I try them too. And day. I, yeah. It just doesn't work for me. Uh, the truth of the matter is, what I'm busy busy it can be crazy hours and seven days a week and then other times I have a month off and I do nothing <laughs> so yeah. yeah it's yes that's one of the things I do like about it is that I can sort of push and pull mm -hmm. as the needs of my sort of family and your other life, things your yeah. life leads your what you can potentially fulfill in that in that time I remember thinking the run up to Christmas my family might disagree with that <laughs> yeah. the kids going where's mom and the answer is always in the studio yeah are you, are you... yeah Christmas Eve <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. I think um, you had a question yeah oh. it's just that that's all I really wanted to say was that it's inspiring to hear we hear success all the time and that's what we aspire to. But sometimes the, the pressure of that success that mm. is presented to us is a little bit too much. Sometimes small triumphs at the bench. Yeah. Yeah. Really so. But also, I think because they're, they were, they've embarked on something new, the kind of braveness and boldness and kind of like, you know, striding into that territory mm. are ready to do that is going to then enable you to feel like, OK, well, this is how I can tackle the next challenge and how I can tackle the next challenge, I think. I, I do believe once you've kind of done something like that, it in a way it gives you that momentum and that kind of like self-confidence and belief that like, okay, I've done this now. What's, you know, what's next? I think we have a question. This, uh, yes. <laughs> in terms of like the want to make at the end of the day, you say even so how do you choose what calories and the price you have paid? Because people calories are different. Way of training is there any special day, or do you choose where are you like to be paid? How do you? How do you... That's a tricky. I mean, I think it's, it can be a different strategy for different people. I think, isn't it? Yeah, I think it really depends what type of product. So I have friends who make things where they maybe cast things, or you know, there is a sort of mass production element to their making and they might be able to approach you know uh, retail outlets and things that would be inaccessible to me because every piece i make is a one-off pretty much um so yeah i think pricing is complicated <laughs> and i can't promise again that i do all the yeah. things i've been taught tends to be a little bit of a <laughs> i mean i think like what you were saying earlier in a way kind of there's two, there's a two the two prong thing is like assessing like what's realistic in terms of the time for the piece and 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 going from that way but also where do you want to sit in the marketplace yeah. in a sense and what what's the right fit for you is is it a gallery setting or is it a shop you know some people find that shops that are not necessarily just jewelry shops but shops that have other types of things are a better fit for them in terms of the client base you know. There's all those kinds of considerations isn't there. No, it's true. Like the show that I'm doing this weekend is not a jewelry show. It's a place where a lot of architects and design junkies go to get their fix of. But I would know, imagine your stuff. But they, they, they get my yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, if I were to pitch myself to a gallery that specialised in gold and diamond jewelry, they honestly, I do those. Sh I've done shows, and people look at my stuff and literally go. Oh, <laughs> and you're like, that's fine. You're not my person. I, you cannot design for everyone. You cannot appeal to everyone. And if you do, if you try and do that, you're doing it wrong. A piece of jewelry should be something that somebody absolutely loves, not something that they feel a bit indifferent about. I'm not designing to be for people to feel indifferent. I want to make something that someone loves. And if you don't love my work, Fine, go and find someone else's work that you will love because they'll be your person and that's great for you. So, yeah. And I mean, design for me, I design stuff that I like and I would wear 
And if I design something and I don't really like it, it gets edited out of my collection because it starts to become a bit confused. I think your work has to have a strong identity. It's very disciplined. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I you don't see the hundreds of pieces that I melt and I <laughs> break and I, all sorts of things. So, you know. Oh, but that's definitely come from your previous career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. And think, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Um, all of you guys seem to have like quite a distinctive style, and you picked up earlier about saying about identity. Um, what would you say like earlier on when you were designing at the beginning stages, and you get inspiration from all these different places and all these different things? Like how do you like refine down to something that's very unique? And, like you look at something and you go, oh, that's that person. But like, how would you say that process of refining down to that style before? identity like any tips about how you get time. <laughs> lots of time or maybe not lots of time just give yourself a chance to work through and often there'll be things that just well for me personally you just keep coming back to um whether it's subconsciously or overtly present in your work um something that you enjoy in that piece whether it's the making of it or how the final piece looks that's that's certainly what does it for me now definitely I think yeah, my work has surprised me. When I started at Woolley, I was sure I would be making brutalist concrete European art <laughs> uh, So no, it's really surprised me that I've landed up as decorative as I have. And I think the answer is just through lots and lots and lots of projects, my voice kind of emerged. And then once I started making work that looked like that, I became more confident with it. And that's when all those sort of changes and journeys have happened. But yeah, I would agree with Ange time. <laughs> um, I did shine um, at Goldsmith Centre, sorry. And one of the things that they made us do, which was really useful, was write yourself a brief when you start a project. Go off, design things. Keep going back to that brief and go, does that piece sit within well, that yes. collection? Yeah, yeah. And if it doesn't, it's gone, you know? You have to be quite disciplined and you know you can mood board it's like when you pick an outfit what, you, what when you go shopping for clothes you know your preferences yeah you know what you like it's it's a bit like that what material do you like to work in what style do you like yeah. but don't look at jewelry look at other things and and you know hone the inspiration from yeah. those things because then you won't feel so inhibited by going oh but that's a bit like their work i think it's really important i think a lot of we are we all often have that thing we do all the time in our lives in terms of like what we put in our homes what we wear our bodies where we choose to spend our time but we don't always focus on it in a very self-aware way in terms of thinking about how that would filter into an output like in terms of like a jewelry collection or in terms of a piece of art or you know and so it's like it's a it's a similar process we do but what we're doing this time is using it to generate something as opposed to using it as a collector's eye or as a you know Curation. I'm just conscious that Alex was saying oh, yeah. about oh, online. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Someone yeah. online said, yeah. um, ask, sorry, how did you manage to juggle the transition between your old job and your new career, especially if you had a very busy demanding job? I'm still, I'm still, still doing, doing yeah, the day exactly, job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So still juggling, but slightly more manageable. Um, I currently do three half days a week of um, a very physical physio job. And then the rest of the time I'm brainstorming or like yeah, they're not doing anything very much or doing a admin. Um, but yeah, the rest of the time is is jewellery business. Mine was kind of a blunt cliff edge. Uh, yeah, I went from traveling internationally and working and I had one daughter I managed to sort of stitch together childcare where I carried on doing that so I had an amazing childminder my parents and a husband with reasonably flexible work and we managed to manage one child while I traveled internationally but I knew when the second one came along that was not going to be possible so I just literally took that opportunity to start afresh um, obviously, I had two small children at home, so I had a one-year-old and a four-year-old at home at that point, um, and that was when I started at Morley. So, just carving out little bits of time for me, yeah. as Poppy said. Yeah, as you say, I didn't. I did. There wasn't a transitional period. It was like, bang, you're pregnant. Oh, sorry, we're making you redundant. Oh, whoopsie. Um, it was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. A, it was a tricky one, and it was. 
quite, you know, and then I turned to freelancing and I thought I could juggle both. And it turns out like I'm the world's worst freelancer. You don't want to employ me because I've got my opinions are too strong on what I like is what I like. And I like being in control of projects, which is why it suited me so well to do something that is like I'm designing, I'm making the decisions. You so, have to be much more flexible. With yeah, I'm not free flexibility. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Any other online questions? Oh, a question in the audience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I want to ask you about, um, as a mom of two kids, I also want to ask you about uh, what's the most difficult thing you're thinking about in your career? Is about uh, how you get your inspiration, or you think about uh, marketing, or just uh, your relationship with family. The most difficult thing. No, you drag them to all the exhibitions. <laughs> it's good for them. <laughs> it is. Our education isn't enough, so I take them and I make their lives. And if you're watching at home, kids, hi. <laughs> it's you know, carve out that time to do stuff because it's not just benefiting you, it's benefiting the next generation. You're treat, teaching them to appreciate craft and design. And just pitch it, turn it. <laughs> I think probably for each of us, it's something different. I think the most difficult thing for me personally is probably the bit that Poppy maybe actually is really amazing at, which is the kind of marketing stuff and rubbish at it. <laughs> utterly, utterly rubbish. <laughs> so. Yes, me too. <laughs> Well, I don't have family to juggle, that's my get out, so. an <laughs> excuse. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think it, I think it, even, you know, I've had times where I've been juggling uh, education work or sector develop, you know, sector development work, other things. So I think, I think also, even within your practice, it's a challenge balancing, for example, um, I would say things like commissions and things like creating stock or your or your kind of best sellers and like how they kind of progress and they like move forward so they don't stay stagnant with creating space to like push your practice forward i find that can be a challenge especially as you get further further away from like structured experiences whether it's education or workshops or residencies like really to make sure that you're doing that in your own practice for yourself like creatively and for you to in order to give yourself that time to kind of like think about where you want to go strategically but also like in terms of what will feed you in terms of a maker I think that could be a real challenge so that's a challenge of, that you balance as well as the other demands of like life that like, I don't have children but I have I've had you know elderly uh relatives and, and family members that I've had to ha take you know do stuff with care around so I think like there's a we've always got those balances don't we but um I think the thing is often if you are somebody who has to segment that time, it does in a way focus you with the time that you have doing the work. And so sometimes, even though it's a challenge, it, in a way it can be um, a strong motivator to keep you moving forward because you don't have like all the time in the world. You have to think, how are you going to utilize this time that you have, whether it's at the bench or whether it's gaining um, images or inspirational material, or whether it's going out and like connecting and kind of making those networks that can help build and support your growth. But well, good luck. <laughs> making this great, that's yeah. the playing bit this season on the course, that's even more fun. But actually, like when you say SEO, I used to just like, oh, oh. And I think that's really important. Yeah. The marketing stuff is really important if you want to be a business. So <laughs> how do you find ways to force yourself to do that aspect of it. For example, have you gone on a course or do you just go, right, I've got three hours, I'm going to crack in the image SEO today. Help. Should we say, I'm going to write down. I like messaging out. I wouldn't say I've cracked it, but I'm, I'm quite sort of stubborn. If I don't know something, um, like, you know, if it's, to change a light bulb. If I know it's not going to electrocute me, I'll give it a go. So same with <laughs> learning about SEO. If I know it's not going to crash my computer, 
um, I was able to find a really great um, uh, Facebook group all about business SEO. And it was geared at small businesses, people who knew absolutely nothing. And initially it was really scary, you know, literally taking your images and doing this and thinking, oh my God, am I going to delete my image if I do this? And just learning step by step to the point where I now set myself or set myself back then and try and stick to an hour a week of admin. And whether that is optimizing my pages on Google, making sure I haven't got any broken links on my website, all of these things, because as I think you mentioned earlier, Mel, you, we can have a website, we probably said, and put it out there. Nothing happens, creates unless you have all the back stuff. Yeah. And until I can afford to pay someone to do that all for me, I have to do it myself. Yeah, but also, like you said, it needs maintenance, yeah, right? Exactly. It's not something that just once it's there, yeah. it has to exist. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you do want to sell your stuff, there's no point making lots of pretty things and putting them online and just, you know, praying it's not going to happen. You have to put in the, the sort of groundwork. But I always say if I can do it and I'm a real technophobe. I'm not going to do it. I think I'm just really stubborn and I make myself do these things. But yeah, feel free, feel free to DM me if you want. I think we might have time for one final question before we kind of is it yeah. online? Yeah. online. Um, someone said, I'd love to hear from Ange about her experience of working with television and how it helped develop her career. Um it was really daunting and as I think I mentioned before I throw myself in at the deep end with things and I wouldn't necessarily call myself an outgoing person I was chatting to Poppy earlier and I said I'm an extroverted introvert I dress the way I don't feel right? <laughs> I'm a relatively shy person so doing the whole TV thing was a really big step um going for the audition having several stages and even to the point where they said okay you've been chosen doing do I really want to do this no. um but it was a brilliant experience the crew um were amazing you know they treated everyone all the makers really respectfully brought out all the best in us and I think obviously they want it to be good tv um but we felt really looked after um in terms of how it's helped my career it certainly exposed my work to uh, a wider audience in the UK, which has been great. You know, I'm working on some lovely commissions off the back of it and have had some lovely sales. And it's it's really strange. As soon as the show aired, people were buying stuff, but people were also messaging me and saying, well, I've just seen you on TV. I'm like, I know, I was there. I'm not there. <laughs> You did really well. I really love your work. Where can I find you? Um, so, yeah, you know, again, it's not even necessarily doing TV. It's about trying things that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, whether it's a new technique of making or going to an exhibition that you don't necessarily think you'll be interested in. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. Thank you all very much. I mean, I think this has just been really great. So many insights and also obviously great to have a nice and engaged audience. Um, yeah, so basically, I just want to thank all of you for being here with us this evening and the audience and online for engaging. And I'm going to hand over to Helen and Terry um, to kind of wrap, wrap up. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Um, sorry, Terry Hunt, Chair of the ACJ. Um, and um, there's so many words that I could say in relation to this wonderful link that the ACJ has with Morley. But very specifically, what we've seen tonight is very varied work, very varied careers. Um, and as I said, early careers and um, one of the things that <clears throat> when you get to my age you have a certain perspective of things and certainly it's been great to actually watch these particular individuals with and in their early careers i look forward to their continuation but in terms of another aspect of, of, of the perspective 
which I'm able to bring. Uh, many of you know <coughs> that I've been connected with, shall we say, Birmingham School of Jewellery for <coughs> many years. And um, in the 60s, sorry, it was started in 1890, but in the 60s, 1960s and early 70s, the current, the, the headmaster of the school at that time, and yes, he was called the headmaster, uh, was Ralph Baxendale, uh, silversmith. And he was a very blunt Yorkshireman, but a fantastic guy, mainly because he was under great pressure from his bosses to do what was happening across the whole country. A lot of higher level courses were being introduced. Higher education was being encouraged, promoted, and his bosses and the bosses of a lot of other colleges, because jewellery didn't really happen in universities then, but in colleges, the lower courses were called lower courses and they should be got rid of because we had to move up, we had to move to the higher education. It's all degree courses and higher diploma courses. Ralph Baxendale stuck out and said, no, 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 no. Birmingham is not going to follow the trend. We are not going to get rid of further education courses. And for God's sake, he managed to do it, as I and others did following Ralph, who retired in 1974. And not many people currently involved with the School of Jewellery realised that the what they owe to the likes of Ralph Baxendale in continuing that involvement with further education. What I'm saying is that's my experience of Birmingham, but it's why we're so pleased in the ACJ to promote and continue and work with Morley College. Because as we've heard tonight, Morley College does a fantastic job. Okay, it does a fantastic job actually in everything else, doesn't it? The room we were in earlier, obviously they were teaching Italian, that was all up on. We just did the music. With wafting through the through, through the windows. You know, all the range of things that they do here, it's wonderful. But of course, for us, the main thing they do here is jewellery, and they do it really, really well. <laughs> so a big, a big round of applause, please, not just for all these people around here, but for Morley College. <laughs> Well, thank all of you for coming this evening. I hope you enjoyed the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.